from the city of Beaky Blinders, Birmingham, England, I would like to introduce you to Paddy Dandar. As the world becomes more automated and the robots take over, it's imperative that we build the right human skills for the future. So pull up a chair, grab a smoser or two, and make yourself very uncomfortable. Hey folks, thank you for joining us for another episode of the Super Power School podcast. I'm your host, Paddy Danda, and today I'm joined by two amazing people. First of all, Vera Mehat, how are you doing, my awesome co-host? I'm good, thank you, and even better because you always call me awesome, but awesome co-host. <laughs> You're awesome too, Paddy. Oh, there we go. We all need to be awesome. And yeah, we need people to tell us that, I think, sometimes. Otherwise, we forget, don't we? So it's a good little reminder. But yeah, you are awesome. And what have you been up to lately, Vera? Because I haven't heard from you. You've kind of gone quiet on me. (laughs) I have. I've been, I guess, maybe I've had too much work in progress, but I've got little things going on. And I have to blame you as well, Paddy, because it's all the inspiration from our podcast guests is been making me like want to think oh I must try out this project I must do this thing and so I've got all these sorts of things going on but it's been fun but like for instance I've been helping with this local creatives group and we've been setting up on me to also started a new job I have to say best job I've ever had. I'm being rude because we haven't introduced our special guest today so We have somebody who is a researcher in academia, and I'd love to welcome Riker Jensen to the show. How are you doing? Thank thank you very much. I thought I was getting awesome too, but I guess you don't really know that yet. So so maybe there's going to be an awesome later. Well, we can only hope. It's like a default awesome for all of our guests. (laughs) They are on another level. So yeah, (laughs) you've acquired that title anyway. I appreciate it. I don't really know you that well, and I know Vera knows you really well. So I'm going to take a bit of a backseat in this conversation and let you sort of natter away. And I'll just be like jumping in every now and again. But it'd be great to know a little bit about your background just to kick things off so that the listeners and the viewers can get to know you a bit better. I'm not from the UK. So I'm originally from a very small place called the Faroe Islands, which is part of, well, I was going to say part of Denmark, and I might not be able to go back to the Faroe Islands. but but it's part of the Danish kingdom. So yeah, it's a small a small place with 18 islands. But other than that, my background is I'm currently in information security, but specifically working with groups, people at the edge or the margins of, of societies where I'm trying to understand security needs, security practices amongst people Yeah, in these kind of different contexts. But my getting there, I spent some time in, started out in performance arts. Before that, I did a lot of theatre and then gradually ended up somehow in information security. But I guess there are many roads to nowhere or to somewhere. I don't know what the, I won't say that, but that's how I, yeah, I guess that's my background. I had a stint in journalism as well at some point. I've just realised that, so some people might be listening, they might have heard about cyber security Maybe information security they might not have heard of. So because you teach it so often, would you be able to give us a quick explanation of, you know, information security and then maybe even how it relates to your work as well? Yeah, I can definitely give it a go. I think there's so many, there'll be many, as many definitions of what cybersecurity slash information security slash digital security, we can kind of try and tease them apart, but are as many of us teaching it, we'll probably have different definition. So we are an information security, which is kind of an old way of talking about cybersecurity, which is really talks about protecting information, protecting data, and to some extent protecting technology. So, you know, different ways of securing those entities. When we then think of cybersecurity, it becomes a bit more fluid, right? So, or, or much intangible in some ways. We're still talking about protecting information, data, and technology, but sometimes in a virtual sense as well. And if we then think about, at least this is what, what some argue, if we then think about digital security as more inclusive. So, whereas digital security includes both the information, the data, the technology, as well as people, and whilst we might talk about users, I'm not a fan of talking about users because users are people. And therefore, I think if we reduce people to users, I think we're losing a lot of what makes 
people uses and vice versa, if that makes sense. So I talk about people. But anyway, so that's at least the kind of trajectory or the ways in which people have talked about these different terms that kind of overlap in many ways and often used anonymously. But if you really want to, to, to separate them, then that's some of the things. But it's really about protecting technology information data. I'm not actually that interested in technology or in informational data for that matter. I'm only interested in how it then affects people and the social environments within which that people inhabit. And the technologies might exist in these environments as well. So I always start with the social context. And that's why I said before, working with people in these marginalized or at-risk environments is I want to understand the security needs that they have so we can then build technologies, secure technologies that can work for them. But that means that we cannot start with technology and we have to start with people and the social context because then we can begin to think. And sometimes technology is not the solution at all. And I don't know if you heard the intro to these podcast episodes, but when Paddy plays it, like he's, he's got, oh, robot taking over the world, all this stuff. <laughs> Like, how do we keep up with this, like, constantly evolving technology? But from your perspective, you know, it's better to start with, you know, what's uh, what's the human point of view first. Yeah. I, you've also told me a little bit about some of your projects before. Are you able to talk about, like, the Hong Kong project that you did? Yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, this is all published, so none of this is at all secret. So Vera's saying the Hong Kong project. So in, yeah, it was... 2020, where the work was carried out and it was published last year, if I remember correctly. So we did some work with protesters in Hong Kong as part, part of the anti ELA protests in, in Hong Kong. And it was to try and understand their security needs and their practice. How did they do security? So, for example, thinking about onboarding in these groups, right? So if you're part of a protest group, how do you onboard new members? You know, how that's uh, how do you do that? In this case, it was working with cryptographers, people who had been part of the protest and were part of the protest in Hong Kong, would be on the front line in Hong Kong as well. They talk about frontliners as potentially being confronted with law enforcement as, as the frontliners and some that had been part of the protest, but not part of the front line. So that was kind of uh, the people we spoke to. And it was absolutely fascinating to hear them talk about the different practices that they didn't necessarily think of as security, but they just had to have devise certain ways of protesting to keep themselves as secure as they thought they could be, but without damaging their cause, right? So there was this thing of, we want to be in the street, we want to go and, and protest, this is really important, and we have to give up some security. And, and protection to do that. But there were things that they were relying upon as in the, in the work that we published, I can talk about it. So they were relying on really, like really insecure technology, such as uh, Live360, which is basically a family tracking app where someone would stay outside the protest and when the group went protesting to track their whereabouts and to see if they suddenly dropped off, they might have become arrested and then they will find ways of trying to find and locate them and give them and help them if they were in police custody. And the other things like WhatsApp, so probably many listeners here will, will use WhatsApp or at least know what it is. They will also use WhatsApp to create smaller groups, for example, trusted groups. And if, again, tracking each other through WhatsApp and if someone was assumed arrested, they would kick that person out of the group because they want to protect the rest of the group. So if the police got hold of this, their WhatsApp group, then they would know who the other protesters were. And therefore, what this told us, so this is just the story, but what this told us was there are certain security wants and needs that they felt they had or they had that the technologies weren't giving them, right? So there were certain things they had to make a way to make this work for them. And the technologies just weren't, weren't giving them the security that they thought they were relying upon, if that makes sense. They're relying on these technologies to do the protest. But on the other hand, they were also being, facing threats through those technologies. So, so yeah, so there were quite a few 
few things that came out of that project. Onboarding, as I started with, one of the few questions we started with was, how do you onboard new members? It was very clear that none of that happened through technology. It was all about trust relations, standing, you know, shoulder to shoulder, build trust, and you wouldn't onboard anyone until you'd seen people in the street being part of the protest. So it was really interesting how we kind of saw the different online and offline relations as well through that. So yeah, anyway, so it was a long thing about our group. But yeah, so we, we're doing quite a bit of work around protests and trying to understand the needs of protesters in these different, different settings and what unites and what doesn't unite them, if that makes sense. And then thinking where can cryptography, in our case, cryptography help and where can't it? And what was interesting is that there has been this move in cryptography that realizing we're not serving some of these marginalized groups. We are designing for a particular population that are not the marginalized. So, so this paper and the work has been quite, has been picked up in many different contexts and we've spoken about it in different contexts because suddenly they're thinking actually there are these mechanisms that people expect, but we just don't design them for. So, so we always use this headline where we say cryptography models social relations because that's, you know, A wants to speak to B and they have to understand how does that happen and they model it based on assumptions and intuition. And we go out and actually explore what are their social relations actually. So, yeah. It's fascinating. I was just listening to all of that and thinking, wow, like I would never have really thought about how sophisticated the protesters had to be, right? Yeah. We just assume they set up a, a Facebook group and go, hey, who likes to join? And then they go, yeah, okay, be here at this time. (laughs) Yeah, but you can't, right? Because one of the things is law enforcement, who are the adversary in this case, can also join that Facebook group. And we had many examples in Hong Kong of there was this voluntary car service where they, where protesters needed to get out of the protest area. Public transport is too dangerous because that's where they would, law enforcement would go and arrest people in the public transport. So they would set up this voluntary car service. There were examples of police officers going undercover as drivers and therefore then arresting protests as they got through this voluntary car service. So there are many of these, absolutely. So you, yeah, so it's a real interesting question around protecting yourself and your group and still being able to protest. And in terms of the numbers of people, like what, what sort of numbers are we talking about here that were involved in these protests? And the other thing I'd be really interested to know is almost... From a leadership perspective, I'm guessing there was a a nucleus of people who came up with all of these strategies. Did you ever get to speak to those folks around, or how did they come up with these strategies? Are these things that they've tried out before? Are these things that they've seen others do? Like, how, how did they even come up with these crazy ideas? Yeah, and... Well, well, that's a really, really good question. So I'll answer the, the numbers question probably in terms of the group. So when I talk about onboarding, I talk about very small affinity groups, right? So these are groups that are trusted members where potentially inf- confidential information is shared within. And in those groups, you don't, you don't have or you don't need anonymity because everyone knows who you are, but you need to have confidentiality in knowing that the information in this group stays within that group, right? So that's what you need. Then you have the big, big Telegram groups. So probably listeners, and maybe you also know about Telegram. So which is often used in these situations as well. People shouldn't, by the way, don't use Telegram. But that should be a message. But anyway, that's a different, different story. Yeah, I understand that the cryptography in Telegram is yeah not great. But what I was going to say was that. So there are big 200,000 people in some of these big groups. And there what you want is anonymity, right? So you don't need confidentiality because you know that that group, you'll have... Police, you know, everyone, your adversary, other factions will be part of these groups. So what you need that for is to spread the word, right? You don't need it for really confidential information that you share with a small group. So that's really, yeah, so that would be the group. So in terms of leaders and how they come up with these ideas. So Hong Kong in particular was branded, for want of a better word, as this a, a leaderless protest. Of course, that's not true. But that was how it was. It was one of his stories was be water so and blossom everywhere. So it's like you can kind of pop up in different, in different places. You also have to remember Hong Kong being kind of a, which was large scale, was also a city, right? It's 
it's quite and highly digitalized. So you can also have these technologies that can that can be part of the process. Of course, and it becomes congestion becomes a problem, et cetera, because there are so many people wanting to use digital service at the same time. But anyway, so that so that is part of, I guess, the, the background. And in terms of the di- different strategies, many of these protesters, especially the ones that were in the affinity groups and the smaller groups, they, they're all young. I mean, I'm now using young quite in a broad sense. Many of them had experience from 2015, the umbrella movement and uh, the protests in 15, where many of these strategies were developed. And therefore, not only do they know each other really well, they also had some of these practices that were already established. Many of them were nothing to do with digital technology. Many of them were just, how do we operate in the street? Like if someone needs helmets at the front, we have different hand gestures that will tell us we need a helmet or, you know, scissors if like this. So therefore they will kind of do it non-digitally because it was just much easier in many ways to do hand gestures. And I think that is also a really important part of the story in, in a broader sense is that if we focus on the technology, we, we also lose the fact that actually sometimes technology has nothing to do with it. And, and certainly for these protests in the street, because of congestion and things were happening all the time, it was easier sometimes just to leave the technology alone and then just be part of the protest. So the strategies we've really learned from, from 15 and then the groups would mirror each other. So I spoke to, to some protesters who, who said, we, we, we look at what some of the established groups are doing and then we're trying to copy their strategies. We know, I'm paraphrasing now, we know that we can't do like complete security, but do, we do the best we can. And that was yeah, something. But this is not specific to protests. I mean, I've done work with refugees and I've done work with on board ships. I spent some time on, on container ships to observe and explore security practices in these different contexts. And people find, talk about creativity before, right? So people find ways that are grounded in their context and current situation and their needs, right? And there's so much cool work done recently across many of these different marginalized communities. And we've seen very distinct needs that are just not being met by the technologies that are being, being developed, right? Because we, do use it as, we usually design for the mainstream rather than the margin. So, so, yeah. Can you share some of those other interesting stories? Yeah, so there's been really interesting. So security work done around GBQ clubs, communities and their concerns online of, you know, joining group that can potentially support them in different ways, but that also makes them very visible. So this constant dichotomy of, of wanting a network or, or a community of sorts, which sometimes exists online, but then on the other hand, you might give up certain privacy need by doing that. So that's been a few works done around that. There has been a growing body of work with migrants and refugees in different contexts, whether it's within refugee camps or whether it's with refugees fleeing and the kind of duality of the technology in that sense, you know, how a mobile phone, there's been really cool work done around mobile phones, is that how a mobile phone might enable you to get to, I was going to say the promised land, that was, that was wrong, but at least to get away to, because it can be a guide and you can also stay in contact with others. But it's also a surveillance tool potentially for border officers or border control that can track where you've been, if you've been in the wrong places or where you're coming from, et cetera. So is this real or, or tracking you and finding you? Is there real tension in a technology in this way? That makes so yeah, so there's been a, a growing body of work that works at the margins with different communities. And now we just need to find a way of tying it together. And so as we wrap up this episode, Rika, do you have any... Uh, resources that people could go to, any specific books or research that people might find useful if they want to know more about this field that you are passionate about? So it's kind of combining different things. There's an ethnography book. It's a classic called Ethnography Principles and Practice by Hammersley and Atkinson, Paul Atkinson and Martin Hammersley. I can't remember which edition it is in now. 
But that book is in a quite a neat way sets out the ways. And, and even if you're not into research, even if it's just about engaging with people, that kind of sets out, they've got field relations and stuff like that. But it's all about how you engage with people. One of the key things with that is that you really recognize your own impact um, in your world, in the, in the environment around you. So we don't shy away that we go and spend X number of months in a place that we also impact that place and the people within it. But I think even if you're in, not into research or ethnography specifically, I think just generally kind of this recognition is that we, we evolve together and we, the space that was is now a new space or different nuanced space, if that makes sense. So, so I think that one would be a good one. So yeah, ethnography principles and practice would be one. And then of course, as I said, there's lots of research specifically around these marginalized groups, which I will always suggest that people do a search. And Is there anywhere where we can find that type of research? Is it like a central hub or is that pretty much just Googling? Some of yeah, Google Scholar. It's, Google Scholar is a good way to search some of these. There are some key conference venues, of course. So something called CHIES, which is it's just kind of key conference venue which has proceedings which is human factors research but it has it's very diverse yeah it's chi and it's it's a lot of really interesting from digital civics to not specifically around security but it's human computer interaction research in different way but otherwise there is usenic security which now have a specific stream which looks at higher risk users and their security needs that would also be one if you're interested in that space. And it is specifically computer security, but they're beginning to recognize the, the value and the more socially oriented reason. Oh, thank you so much. I've really enjoyed this episode. I've learned a huge amount and I've decided to look at protesters in a completely different way, having heard your insight. Good. So thank you so much. 